Uh, this week, uh, for Soul Seminar Online, Stacey Smith will be presenting. She is currently at University of Colorado Boulder. Stacey has gotten her PhD working in Iochroma, working on the, the phylogenetics of it. Uh, then she continued on working on floral color in Mark Rush's lab in Duke. Uh, and then from there, she started to look more at comparative methods within floral color, uh, broadly within an Iochroma. And today she's going to be talking about uh, colors within soul and AC and giving us a little lesson about that. So when you're ready, you can start Stacey. Okay. Um. So everybody see my slide and hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yay. Okay. Yeah, so I think maybe maybe after seeing Dick's talk, I felt like, oh yeah, it'll be fun to do something sort of historical. So I'm going to um, today talk really a lot about work that's not my own. And so I hope that I get it right. Um, there's certainly the possibility that I get it wrong, so I hope people will jump in um, and say, well, that's not quite the history of um, petunia genetics. But anyway, this is like Stacy's understanding of petunia genetics. So um, I'm going to talk just sort of broadly about how colors are made and what we've learned um, from work in the Solanaceae. So I don't think I have to remind anybody that this is a very colorful family. This is a family where we have um, basically the, the entire spectrum of colors that you can find almost across angiosperms. Um, and I think what's particularly cool is that the colors uh, show up in lots of different plant parts. So obviously we have um, a lot of color in flowers. By the way, can people see my, um, my mouse? Yeah. yeah, we yeah. can see your mouse. Great, thanks Chelsea. Yes. So, um, so we, have, we have colorful flowers, but of course we also have very colorful fruits and even vegetative parts can be very colorful. Um, something else that's not unique to Solanaceae, but certainly very common in the family is that even within organs of the plant that are colored, there's often um, very fine scale patterning. So you can see it in the potatoes, you can see it in these Kelly Brackoa flowers and these heirloom tomatoes. And as I think you'll see, that's part of the reason that Solanaceae has been um, so important in learning about the mechanisms underlying color variation is that there's this fine scale patterning often across organs and within organs. And that patterning is due to the regulation, the, the, the plant deciding precisely when and where to turn on pigments. And so, um, so Solanaceae has taught us a lot, not just about how pigments are produced, but how plants decide when and where to turn on pigments. And in learning that, those, those regulatory questions, they actually apply broadly across um, lots of groups of organisms. Okay, so a bit of background about um, the biochemistry of color. Um, so in some, in some organisms and in, in some plants, um, color is structural, that is it has to do with um, the, the, the physical properties um, of the tissue, but for the most part in plants, coloration comes from pigments. And these are the three main categories of pigments. Um, probably some of you know that this bottom category of pigments, the betalins, um, is found in the caryophyllales, but not um, in other groups. So there's no, there's no betalins in solanales. So I can turn that one off. So, um, all the pigments that Solanaceae have to work with fall in these two categories, the anthocyanins and the carotenoids. Um, and I'm showing here a close-up of, um, this is a petunia petal cut in half, and you can see um, these conical epidermal cells where the vacuole is full of anthocyanin pigments. Um, and then here's marquia, not my own picture. Um, but if you look in marquia petals, you can see that uh, the um, the color comes from chromoplasts, so these discrete bodies that contain carotenoids. Um, and they look like, in this case, little slivers, sort of. So actually it's very similar to what it looks like inside of a carrot, these sort of spindle-like um, plastid structures. So these are the two main categories of pigments that we find. Um, and we know a good deal about how these pigments are produced. So like, what are the biochemical steps that lead to the production of these pigments. So um, I'm showing two schematics of these pathways. Um, you'll see lots of different drawings of these if you Google them. 
Uh, I'll just talk you through just sort of, if you're not used to looking at these, what you're looking at here. Um, so I picked depictions of the pathway that show um, the biochemical structure of these, uh, these intermediates and of the products. So here are the, here are the anthocyanins, actually the anthocyanidins, but um, the, this step immediately before making anthocyanins. Um, so uh, you can see they're pretty small molecules. By contrast, carotenoids are these sort of big honking hydro, uh, hydrophobic um, molecules, these long strings here. Um, and so both of these pathways uh, have been known for a, for a fair amount of time. I actually don't know how far back the carotenoid path, how, how, how long ago the carotenoid pathway was elucidated. Um, the anthocyanin pathway of the pieces really got put together in the 90s, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but in each case, what you're seeing is that these arrows are enzymatic reactions, and the enzyme is shown beside the arrows. So like DFR is an enzyme that takes these dihydroflavanols and turns them into something not shown, but leucoanthocyanidins that then um, uh, the next enzyme in the pathway ANS works on. And the same is true over here, um, where each of these arrows um, has an enzyme beside it that does the step that makes the next, um, the next substrate. Okay, so I wanna talk for a little bit about um, how we learned about these pathways um, and what we know about them today. So I, the pathway I know best is the anthocyanin pathway. Um, I note that it's part of the larger flavonoid pathway. So sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the flavonoid pathway, um, and it really depends on which, which set of substrates you're talking about or which set of products you're interested in. Um, and so down here, as I mentioned before, these are the anthocyanins. Um, these, uh, these compounds are found um, all across angiosperms, so it's pretty clear that this entire pathway um, is shared by all of angiosperms. So it's at least as old as angiosperms are, which we don't, we're not totally confident about how old that is, but let's say 150 to 250 million years old, somewhere in that window. Um, it's been, uh, people have been working for a while to try and figure out um, whether the pathway goes back even farther, and if so, how far, and um, it's still an open question. There's been some recent really exciting work that anybody who's kind of a plant biochemistry nerd um, should check out if you haven't um, by Kevin Davies and his colleagues looking at um, the pigments in liverwort. So you can see they make these reddish pigments that, you know, if you were to look at these under a microscope, they're reddish pigments, they sit in the vacuoles, they, they look like cyanidins would look in a cell, but it turns out they're not cyanidins, they're a different class of flavonoids that they've named aronidins. Um, but anyway, the, the liverworts seem to make these compounds using some branches of this pathway, but not the precise one. So probably some bits of this pathway were assembled um, early on in land plant history. Uh, and then it's really unclear when this coalesced to being uh, this, this, um, this particular configuration, whether it happened way before angiosperms or right before. But anyway, all of angiosperms have what I'm showing here. Um, all the way through to delphinidin, all these branches. Okay, so how do we, how did we learn, how does anybody learn what any of these pathways look like? Um, well, essentially, uh, people um, do classical genetics looking at mutants and how they affect um, the chemical composition of the plant. And so different pieces of this pathway were originally uh, elucidated in different organisms. So for example, um, this first step in the pathway CHS was actually discovered in parsley. Um, CHI was discovered in the French bean. And then some of these other steps, these flavonoid hydroxylase steps here, these F prime steps, um, these were discovered in petunia. Oops, I didn't mean to go far just yet. So um, initially, people were figuring out different enzymes and different species did these different reactions. But um, quickly, people started to discover that these, um, these enzymes were found across species. Um, and doing the same jobs, which is, which is how um, we infer that the common ancestor of angiosperms had this. So, so basically, you know, all of angiosperms have something that looks like CHS that's doing this first step in the pathway. So initially, um, lots of different organisms contributed to understanding the steps of this pathway. But as it became um, better and better known, um, researchers started focusing on a pretty small number of model systems. Um, and in particular, the important ones were petunia, snapdragon, and maize, um, and arabidopsis. So um, in a few model systems, people started to put together the steps of this pathway and realize that 
um, the, the enzymes they found doing the job in petunia were, um, had some ortholog that was doing the same job in, um, say, corn. So this was the state of affairs um, in uh, 1995. And I remember using this paper a lot as a beginning graduate student and referring to it as a recent review, which tells you that I've uh, been doing this for a while. Um, but anyway, so they compiled this table of where things were at um, with some of these major model systems, maize, snapdragon, and petunia um, in 95. And so you can see <coughs> that um, and when you, in many ways, Petunia is sort of um, leading the charge as a model system here. So Chalcone isomerase, uh, the, the locus had been identified in Petunia before it was in Snapdragon, uh, before it was found in Snapdragon and Maze. And part of the reason that Petunia was so valuable is that there were all of these, um, there were all of these uh, existing uh, ornamental uh, cultivars and also um, some, uh, some lab strains that had variation in these genes. Um, so the, so the basically the, the mutations were, were out there and known. All of this floral variation was there, and it was a matter of linking uh, these mutants that were, that were already known to which particular gene it was in the pathway. And so this is just an example from, um, from this Holson and Cornish paper showing uh, some of the early transgenic work where people were um, turning genes off and on. And that's one way, of course, that you, you figure out that that's the gene that's missing in this mutant is to, is to complement it. So um, I really like this paper. Uh, I often mention it to people in my lab because I think it's, I mean, this is what you really call a model system. So this paper is from 1984. Uh, and I just love the title, very descriptive. A short description of the action of 91 genes, their origin and their map location. So in Petunia, um, in 1984, this was a table listing all of the, the loci that had some phenotypic effect um, that had been discovered through crosses um, or uh, through other means. Uh, so like transposition, uh, uh, transpose on insertion. And so I wanna draw your attention to this portion of the table that has these and lines. So, and was short for anthocyanin. So these are all loci that when you mutate them, they affect anthocyanin production. And so um, in total, out of these 91 genes, 33 of them, 33 loci affect anthocyanin production. So the petunia folks were sitting on uh, a pool of 33 genes known to affect, known to sit somewhere in the anthocyanin pathway or to talk to it. And so, you know, my sense is that They've just sort of been working through this list uh, piecemeal, identifying these genes and figuring out where they sit in this pathway over time. Oops, I'm back on. Okay, so this was a, a huge resource. Um, and I guess I'll pop to the next slide. So this is an example then of folks taking um, one of these mutants and figuring out, so one of these loci, the AN11 locus, and figuring out what's the gene that sits under that locus. Um, and as you can see, they actually have lots of um, different alleles at this locus, and uh, these are due to um, different transposon insertions. And so you can see, for example, in this case, um, where the transposon hops back out of the gene, you get the wild type phenotype, the, the pigment production restored. And so basically they have all these different versions of AN11 with different transposons that have hopped in, and those transposons, um, allow them, you know, they act as tags so that people can go and find this gene. So they know the transposon has hopped in this gene, they go find where the transposon is, they know they're in the locus, and they use that information to clone it. And so I think this paper was in, the, I think this was in the 80s, and then here we have, um, I think this paper was in the 2000s, cloning out this protein. And I mentioned before that um, all of this work in Petunia has been really important for molecular genetics broadly, um, so in this, uh, in this AN11 example, the gene turned out to be a transcription factor that's part of the WD repeat family of transcription factors, then in fact it's found in yeast and plants and animals, so it's a widespread group of trans uh, transcription factors. So learning um, how this gene works and what it does in petunia is part of learning what it does broadly across eukaryotes. Um, I couldn't help but mention while I was here, 
I think it's useful for us to have sort of in our back pocket examples of cases where um, really important phenomena were discovered in plants um, that we then learned were widespread across other organisms. And I think one of the examples that pops to mind most easily is the discovery of gene silencing. And so um, I thought I'd show you this paper because it's part of the petunia flower color genetics history. Um, so the story is that um, in attempting to make a more intensely pigmented petunia, um, this group overexpressed CHS, the first step in the pathway, and you can see that it made um, very dark, tartly colored petunia flowers. So it was working. The plant was shunting a lot of its uh, resources towards making um, more pigment. Uh, but at some point, the plant went, you know, hey, hold on here. Uh, this pigmentation is eating up a lot of my resources. I'm spending way too much phenylalanine making pigmentation. We're going to have to shut this down. And so the plant silenced this, um, this introduced gene and at the same time silenced its native copy. Um, so actually that's why it was originally called co-suppression because um, the plant silenced the introduced gene and it silenced uh, the endogenous, the, uh, uh, its own um, internal copy of this gene. So both genes were suppressed. But anyway, this was how people discovered, well, holy cow, um, plants can silence RNA. They have the ability to, uh, to jump in at the transcript level and turn down a gene that um, is out of whack. And so this was, of course, later discovered to be, you know, gene silencing is widespread, but um, it's really uh, motivated by this case in petunia. I also think it's interesting, you can see this, the petunia is kind of looks, looks sad when it was spending too much phenylalanine making pigments. And now the vegetative tissue looks great once it shut down um, all that CHS uh, expression. Anyway, so just something I think is good to have in your pocket for when people ask you, well, what have we really learned from um, basic genetics in plants or, or basic biology in plants? This is a fantastic example. Okay, so I alluded to the fact that part of the reason that Solanaceae, and here I've mostly been talking about petunia, is so um, valuable for learning about um, these, these pigment pathways and how genetics works is that there's this fine scale regulation. And I thought I'd put a picture up of one of the more recent petunia cultivars that I don't have, but I really wish I had it. It's really pretty called night sky. Um, so you see this, this really fine scale patterning of um, pigmentation. And that's possible because um, plants have the ability to regulate so precisely when and where this pathway is turned on. And we now know a really um, a good deal about how this regulation happens. What are the genes and how do they talk to each other? Um, I really like this paper. If anyone wants to read a review on this, is a beautiful paper by Nick Albert, sort of putting all the pieces together. And I'll tell you, this looks complex if you don't spend a lot of time looking at this, but take a minute to look at the flowering time pathway or something, and you'll think this is like pretty straightforward and awesome. So I think it is pretty straightforward and awesome. So I just want to mention one of the key features of this, um, this pathway. Uh, uh, the regulation of this pathway is that the, the core of it has to do with these three transcription factors that stick together. And I just mentioned this because it'll come up um, a bit later. Um, and I, so AN11 that I already told you about is the WDR protein here. There's these two other kinds of proteins, um, BHLH proteins and MIB proteins. I'll mention MIBs again in a bit, so this one's kind of important. But basically what happens is these three transcription factors are expressed they stick together and they form an activator complex that sits down on anthocyanin genes. Um, oops, sorry, oops, I went the wrong way. Sorry, I keep reading in my mouse, actually can put it forward. So the, this uh, transcription factor complex sits down on anthocyanin genes and turns them on. But there's a bunch of crosstalk um, between this activator uh, complex and environmental signals, um, there's also some repressors that we know about that can come in and say, stop making any anthocyanins, please. Um, so there's a, so this, this is sort of the nexus for information that the plant receives about whether or not it should have anthocyanins on. Okay, so we'll return to that. But, but basically, we know a lot now about how this pathway is regulated. So um, I'll give a little bit of background about the carotenoid pathway. I know less about it. And also my sense is that from a regulatory perspective, we know less. Um, but what we do know about it has been very much informed by another member of the Solanaceae, hooray, um, tomato in this case. And when we think of 
carotenoids, of course, in, uh, in tomato, we think of um, like the lycopene that's produced uh, that makes tomatoes red. And where's lycopene sitting? Here's lycopene in this pathway. Of course, tomato makes um, other carotenoid compounds. And um, because carotenoids are hydrophobic, they are sequestered into chromoplasts. So you can see them sitting here in the chromoplast. Now, even though we think about carotenoids mostly in the context of fruits, I wanna remind you that um, the yellow of these flowers is also due to carotenoids. And if we were to zoom in on the cells, we would see similar um, compartmentalization of pigment in plastids. I'll confess that this picture is not uh, a tomato flower. And now I think to myself, I gotta go take pictures of the tomato flower. This is actually alamanda, but I'll tell you that it would look uh, pretty similar. Um, okay. So um, tomato has been very informative about this pathway and how it works. And I'll just show you one example of some very nice work. A lot of this work has been done by Danny Zamir and Joseph Hirschberg. Um, and so this is an example of where, you know, we've learned something from studying uh, tomato flowers. Uh, we've learned something about the pathway. So there's this mutant in um, tomato called the white flower uh, mutant. It's this white flower locust. And by studying this, um, what this group found, very interesting, uh, is that uh, even though this is the basic structure of the pathway here on the right, um, there are actually multiple copies of genes at these steps that are turned on um, depending on whether or not the, the pathway is active in a chloroplast, a green photosynthetic plastid, or a chromoplast. That is, there's been duplication and specialization of copies of these enzymes for the different jobs. So um, one, one set of genes, the yellow ones, are specialized for working in chromoplasts. Um, and so I just uh, want to note here, this is so different from the anthocyanin pathway where the whole plant is working with the same copy of DFR by and large, or the, the same copy of ANS. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case for carotenoids, and tomato is how we figured out uh, that that's the case. Um, so where are we at with understanding carotenoid regulation? So the, how, how, what do we know about how the plant knows when to turn these compounds on? Um, our knowledge is very incomplete, but even what we know looks crazy complex. And so I'm showing here on the left um, a figure from a, a recent review paper that's um, really nice on this topic by Lauren Stanley and Yawu Yuan, who are at the um, the University of Connecticut stores. Um, so Lauren did her thesis on uh, carotenoid regulation in mimulus flowers, and so she did this nice review to start, like this is the kind of paper that people were doing in the 90s for anthocyanins, and we're just getting to that point at carotenoids, being able to ask, how is this pathway regulated? And are the same regulatory factors used across different tissues and different taxa? And the short answer to that is, nope. Nope, it's really, it's really wild and confusing. So um, this figure is showing just in tomato how the fruit ripening genes talk to the pathway. So down here are the fruit ripening um, transcription factors. And then all of these wild lines up here are how those transcription factors talk to the genes of this pathway. Um, as I said, these are just the fruit ripening genes. They have another figure that looks just as busy that is for the not fruit ripening genes that talk to this pathway. And you'd think, okay, well maybe we figured it out in tomato and then at least we have candidate genes for regulators in um, some other red fruit and some other family. Uh, nope, probably not, because the, it seems like these are very tissue specific. Um, now, I don't know why this is, why, why the regulatory situation is so different, um, but I do have one sort of hypothesis is that um, these pigments, which of course make fruits colorful and act as a signal to dispersers, um, these are also always on as accessory pigments in photosynthesis. So all of these carotenoids are sitting in the background um, shunting electrons to uh, the um, electron transport train as part of uh, a chain as part of photosynthesis. So they're doing a really fundamental job for the plant and one that lots of parts of plant physiology need to talk to. So, you know, there's gonna be 
situations in which the plant needs to um, alter their expression due to stress, due to where the seedling is germinating, um, due to plastic responses to any kind of environmental condition, in addition to these developmental changes like making a fruit. And so I think by the nature of how fundamental this pathway is to plant physiology and how many places it's invoked, there's just lots of different genes that talk to it. So um, I hope to study this pathway more in future, but I am uh, I will go in with eyes open as to how complicated it's going to be. Okay, so now that I've given a bit of background about these two pathways, I want to talk about what we've learned about flower color and how it evolves um, from iochroma. So iochroma is the group that I did my dissertation on. Um, this is a little piece of the phylogeny showing um, gains and losses of anthocyanin pigments. Um, this is just a parsimony reconstruction, so certainly there's more uncertainty here, but there's no doubt that anthocyanins have come and gone in flowers multiple times. Some of these losses are recent, so this uh, transition to white flowers in Iochroma loxensia is fairly recent compared to this older loss in um, the quote unquote eight, what I've called the A clade of Iochroma because it has Echnistus sitting in it, although Echnistus now um, has been transferred to Iochroma where it belongs. So anyway, there's been lots of transitions in flower color, and of course, this is one of the reasons I picked this, this group to study. It's so um, florally diverse. I was very interested as a graduate student in SLAM to know, you know, what has driven all of this floral diversification. Um, something else interesting about iochroma that makes it really useful, actually iochromony, this entire clade, um, is that there's also really cool variation within species, not all the species, and we could talk about that later. Some of the species are super boring in terms of flower color. They're, you know, whenever you find an Iochroma cyneum um, population, they're always uh, dark purple. But there are some species, particularly like Eriolarynx, uh, Vasobia, um, which by the way, we're in the process of uh, rearranging these names a bit, um, but uh, that show incredible within population variation. Also down here in this, this euclade, um, uh, this, this group also shows a great amount of within species variation. Of course, this will also be getting a new name. This will be Trisalia, but that's for a different talk. But lots of flower collaboration within and across species. So um, I started working on flower color in earnest as a postdoc, and I picked what seemed to be the easiest case, like what was going to be a very recent transition uh, to a new color, where we knew the candidate genes from other groups like petunia, and so it was going to be as easy as this could be. Um, and so that species here is Iochroma um, gesnerioides, which has evolved red color from a blue ancestor. So um, what I'm going to do is walk you through just very quickly what we found um, from these studies in Iochroma gesnerioides, and I'll give you the, um, the punchline is that uh, even for a very simple switch that should have been able to be accomplished with one gene in the ways it had occurred in other taxa, uh, it instead was accomplished by many genetic changes, none of which were the sort that I expected. Okay, so that's the punchline that I'll return to, but I'll just show you um, what we found. Okay, so, oops. So I did, uh, as you do, some crosses where I crossed my red species with the blue species. I made this F1, this intermediate, um, and produces uh, a different pigment from the parents. And then I did back crosses. And so in these back cross populations, we have segregating variation. And if it was just one gene, if this was simple, just one gene, we would have had um, the F1 phenotype, this purple, and the blue parent, uh, these two phenotypes segregating in this back cross, and as the back cross the other way, we would have also had two phenotypes segregating red and purple. So that would have been the simplest scenario. And so when I didn't get that, I already knew that um, this was going to be a little complicated. So um, the, the, the biggest effect change that I found from this cross um, involved a gene that we, we know is really important for this switch from making red anthocyanin pigments, or excuse me, from making blue anthocyanin pigments to making red anthocyanin pigments. And it's this little gene here that I've put in yellow. And um, by the way, this is the anthocyanin pathway, just a different depiction of it that's a little, um, a little less busy, maybe. Uh, so anyway, this, this gene here is sort of the gateway um, for making purple and blue pigments. So if this is on, then you're heading towards purple and blue, and if it's off, then you're making red pigments. 
So it wasn't a surprise that this gene was involved. Um, uh, and what was surprising is this. So here we see in the back cross to red, two big phenotypic clusters, a purple cluster and a red pink cluster. These clusters are distinguished by the expression of this gene. So far, so good. Yeah, of course, you know, this, oops. If this gene is on, then great, we make purple. If this gene is off, then great, we make pink. But what was strange about it was that um, the genotype at this locus does not predict this difference. So if you actually look at the sequence of the gene, the sequence of the gene doesn't go with this split. So what that told us was that it's not variation at this gene that's causing this expression difference and this split in pigmentation. It's another gene. It's a trans-regulatory change. Some transcription factor has the ability to turn this gene off and on all by itself. So this was something that people had not seen before in um, flower color transitions um, and that was not among my category of candidate candidate changes. This is not something that we thought could happen, um, but sure enough, it does happen. Uh, subsequently, I found out that people do know that, they're, that it's possible to regulate this little gene all by itself instead of turning the whole pathway off and on. Um, and it's known from studies in tomato. Uh, and so I, that, that work is still not completely elucidated, but from tomato, people knew that this gene um, can be turned on separately. Um, so we still have a bit, we still have to identify this transcription factor. Um, and I have uh, a side project with Luke in my lab, uh, who's a postdoc, to figure out what this transcription factor is. And when we find it, we can determine whether or not this is the same transcription factor that's doing the same job in tomato as it is here. But anyway, this was a surprise to me. Um, also a surprise was that one of the genes of the pathway is deleted in the red species. Um, so people had seen um, loss of function mutations involved in uh, flower color transitions, but whole scale gene deletions, not so much. And to make this even more complicated, so I don't have the pathway on the slide, I'll just go back and show you. The gene I'm talking about is this one right here, F3'H prime that does the last step, and you need this gene to make purple pigments, or blue pigments, I suppose. So what's extra complicated is that at some point, this gene duplicated. One of the copies is broken, but one of the copies works. The blue species has to have this gene to make blue pigments, and it does. So there's the, the functional copy in the blue species, and you notice it's simply absent in the red species. The red species has the non-functional copy, but so what, it doesn't work. Okay, so this was a surprise, a whole scale gene deletion um, of a branch of the pathway. So red species can't even do this branch. Okay, so the last change that we saw involved was this uh, change in DFR. So DFR is a downstream gene in the pathway that takes pigment precursors and turns them into pigments. So DFR can work on different precursors, these three different precursors here. Um, <clears throat> and depending on how well it works on different precursors, you, get different, you can get different pigments. And so what we see is that the, the blue copy of this gene works well on blue and purple pigment precursors. And in the red species, DFR has learned to work really great on the red uh, pigment precursor. So this is something, um, the specialization of DFR, theoretically possible, but hadn't been seen to be involved in flower color. And so from studying this one, not very well-known species, just a, you know, your basic Andean shrub that uh, is a little bit cultivated, but was not a, a model system by any means, and it still isn't. Um, we found three types of changes that had not been seen before to be involved in flower color. Um, and so even though these loci and what they do in the pathway was very well known, um, the deletion of a gene, hadn't seen it. Transregulation of this particular gene, nope, hadn't seen that involved in flower color changes, nor had we seen specialization of this, this enzyme. So from, um, so from a species that, you know, uh, just picked out of the wild here as, as a, a naturally occurring transition, nothing that was horticulturally induced, we learned a lot about ways that this pathway can evolve that we didn't know 
from, uh, from model systems. So um, I'll also tell you just a bit about our work on transitions to white flowers that I, I mentioned before. So at this stage, I was more prepared for things not to go as planned um, and to discover things that I didn't expect. So again, starting with my blue species, I did a cross with the white species and I got an F1. So those of you who um, uh, are familiar with, you know, the story of Mendel and his peas, you cross a pink pea and a white pea and their progeny is pink. And the reason is that that mutation that causes the white pea is a loss of function recessive mutation. So when you cross it with the pink, you get back the function. You make a pink, a pink flowered pea. Okay, that's not what happens in iochroma. You cross a purple with a white and you get something that's mostly white. So the white allele here is dominant. So this was a big sort of uh-oh moment because that means whatever did this is not the same gene that people had found in other systems. So I sat on this for a while because I knew uh, a candidate gene approach like I did with the other um, example just wouldn't work because it's, it's not, it doesn't, this gene doesn't act like other genes that we knew. So, so what is it? Um, okay, but I will say one, one reason that I did pursue this, however, is that at least when you did the back crosses, you did get back the parental phenotypes and you got them back in one-to-one. -one. So you back cross to blue and you get half blue, half this F1 phenotype with a little pigmentation, back cross to white, you get white, and then the F1 phenotype with a little pigmentation. So at least it's one gene. So how did we find this, this gene that I knew was not gonna be like the others? Uh, we used a transcriptomic approach and essentially um, we had uh, the parents here and we sequenced their transcriptomes and then I uh, pooled some individuals from those back cross populations and the rationale is this, that if there's one gene making uh, a flower white, then it's um, going to be homozygous uh, for the two white alleles. And if that gene makes, uh, is also the, the one that then, you know, the, the other, the blue allele makes it blue, then whenever we see blue individuals in the back cross, they should have two blue copies of the gene. So what we did is we looked across these pools of individuals and asked, any gene that shows this pattern where all the individuals have two blue isineum alleles and all the white individuals have two white iloxensia alleles, you know, raise your hand. And basically, only one gene raised its hand. And by the time we did this project, um, we knew a little bit more about the regulation of the pathway and about the existence of another class of genes. So I showed you that Albert diagram before, and I mentioned that there's these three classes of transcription factors that glob together and form an activator complex. And then uh, more recently, we learned about this other class of genes um, are three MIBs that can turn off this group, that can, that can repress these activators. So they can act on top of this, this signal to turn it off. And when they do, they then affect um, all these downstream genes. And so you'll notice that the names of this, the name of this gene is similar to the name of one of these genes. So this is an R2, R3 MIB, and this is an R3 MIB. And so the difference is simply in the, the number of repeats. So the R3 has this one R3 repeat, the R2, R3 has two of them. Okay, so this is interesting. Huh, so it's this gene we don't know that much about. And it turned out we knew even less about it than I guess we thought we did. So we built a tree, because I do have a systematics background of MIBS. Um, this was the clade of R3 repressors that we knew about before. So it was known in Petunia, it was called MIBX. Um, yeah, Wu Yuan had also found um, a copy of this gene involved in uh, a species level transition in flower color in Mimulus. He called it R01. So, and it was known from Arabidopsis. So there's this little clade of R3 repressors. Well, guess what? Ichrome is not using that group. It's using a totally different group. Interestingly, this group of R3 repressors is also found, sorry, I keep doing that, my mouse, is also found in other fleshy fruited. Um, uh, members of Solanaceae. So it's also found in Solanum tuberosum, Solanum lycopersicum, like uh, like um, Capsicum annuum. So it's found 
in other members of the berry clade, but it's not in petunia. So sometime between petunia and um, the, the, the divergence of the berry clade, there was a duplication event. Um, uh, also, it's not, it's not Nicotiana. So uh, there was a duplication event that gave rise to this group of repressors. And interestingly, the duplication event happened in a group that were already repressors, but these were R2, R3s. They had two repeats. So this long branch here is a duplication followed by a lot of molecular evolution. And we don't know what happened here because what is it doing in tomato? What is it doing in potato? I don't know, we don't know. If anyone wants to work on that, that'd be awesome. But we know in iochrome it's doing something with respect to flower color. And if we look at the phylogeny, so here's the deletion of that, one of those repeat, repeats. But what else is cool is that it gained a new repressor motif. And I'm not gonna belabor this, except to say that because this copy gained this new motif, we, we're pretty sure actually we know how it works. So thanks again to studies in Petunia, we kind of know how these repressors talk to the activators. So I mentioned to you there's these activators, these three transcription factors that form a complex and they sit down on anthocyanin genes and turn them on. So here's that complex sitting on the anthocyanin genes. These sneaky little R3s come in and they have two possible ways they can function. They can either swap out for like the activator in the complex, and so they basically just titrate out all of these BHLH and WDR partners, and this is called passive re repression. So they basically are just like cleaning out um, the activator genes, or they can be sneakier even, and they can swap out for one of the copies and then go sit down on the anthocyanin um, biosynthetic genes promoter sequences and recruit in silencers. And so this little motif here, that's its job it calls in silencing machinery. And so this will work even more effectively and faster because it's not gonna be all you need is a little bit of this and it's gonna eat up these, um, these the, it's gonna turn this activation complex into a repressor complex. So um, it goes down and silences these genes. And as you can see here, the, the effect is to make a white petunia and that's what it does in Iochroma. As an additional test, um, Dan Gates, who is a graduate student in my lab, um, worked with uh, Tom Clementi and some people at UNL in the transformation facility there. They put it into tobacco, and you can see that even though tobacco doesn't have this R3, the R3 knows what to do. You put this R3 in, and it turns off floral pigmentation just like it does um, in iochroma. So um, I don't really have time to talk about it much, but I've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, how do we go from little fine scale studies back to the big picture? Um, how do we see if these same kinds of genetic changes are happening to give rise to, to um, species level color transitions in other taxa? Um, and so uh, Max Larder, who is a postdoc in my lab, um, looked at expression data for pathway genes across a whole bunch of um, pigmented and unpigmented species in iochromony. And what he found is that over and over again, it's the same, uh, it's the same set of genes that are downregulated. So we don't actually know if it's the same, if it's that R3 or if it's something to do, something else to do with this complex, but it's regulatory um, and it has to do with these downstream steps. And I'll note that what's never involved actually is this um, F3 prime H gene. We don't see that one being consistently turned down. And so it's another verification that what we found in that early red blue cross that this gene has its own transcription factor, its own machinery, um, holds across the clade. So one day we'll figure out what it is, I promise. Okay, so I want to zoom out a little bit. Um, so I've been talking about um, white flowers, uh, and this is this is actually um, taken from Emma Goldberg's study. So this is about uh, 300 or 400 species in the Solanaceae where I've just mapped on flower color. And you can see um, these two types of transitions that I've studied, the white and the red, have really different macroevolutionary patterns. So um, the white, tons of transitions. And what I think is going on here is that the, the MIBs are talking to each other and they're like, turn it up, turn it down, turn it up, turn it down. 
And so that happens over and over again, over evolutionary history. Um, and the pathway underneath is always there. That structure, those enzymes that can make anthocyanins, they're always there. And then the MIBs are just turning it off and on, off on, off on, off on, all over again. So we see tons of transitions. Red flowers are really different. Um, there have been uh, many fewer transitions. Um, and because of this, I decided, oh, we could get a grant and just study the red flowers. There's only a few of them. We could actually go and learn about every single lineage, potentially. And so I'm going to show you a bit of that work because it's, again, the story of, well, this isn't what I expected to happen. Um, so this work uh, was done um, in collaboration with my, my former postdoc, Julianne Ng. So she went all over um, the neotropics, uh, tracking down live material of red flower taxa. So here's a cestrum, here's Plaumania, here's Bergmansia. So these are all her pictures, all taken in the field. So um, in the whole family, we did a big literature survey. We think there's about 34 red flowered species, which depending on um, what you put in the uh, denominator here, comes out to around 1%. So it's a little fraction of the um, total number of species in the family. And she expanded the phylogeny to figure out how old these lineages are. So we thought, well, what we need to do is right around where these red species pop up in the phylogeny, be sure that we've got all of their closest relatives so that we can really figure out how long ago did they evolve? When did this transition happen? And what she found is really interesting, which is that all of these red species, except I think for one shown here, form little singletons. That is, their sister species is not red. They are a little tippy transition. They don't form clades. Um, now, uh, this again is a good lesson for all those listening out there. Picking to study something, the macroevolution, or the macroevolution of something that's rare is um, fun, but really hard because uh, this trait seems to be a dead end, which is to say that when it arises, it prunes itself off the tree. We don't have whole clades of red flower taxa. So that fact in and of itself makes it very hard to study because in, under, in order to understand its history, all we have are these little teeny recent bits of evolutionary history. We don't have whole clades worth to understand um, uh, just basically speciation and extinction rates. So we think that um, this, uh, this pattern here is due to a combination of red flowers being lost, like you don't hold on to the trait very well, and these species tending to go extinct, although it's very hard to get a definitive answer to that question because we just don't have any samples. They keep falling off the tree. Um, okay, so this was interesting and challenging. Um, at the same time, we wanted to know, well, how, how do you make these red flowers? And um, having worked a lot on anthocyanins, I was like, well, probably it's gonna be that you make red anthocyanin pigments. Seems reasonable. Um, so I was expecting that what we would find is this. But we acknowledge that there are other ways to make red. So tomatoes are red, and they're just, they just have carotenoids in them. So we thought, well, it could be red carotenoids. Um, sorry. Uh, the, the other possibility is that um, they do it with both. So this is what mimulus does. And in fact, this is a picture of um, some red mimulus flowers that Ariel Cooley had growing in the, the greenhouse at Duke. So I took some pictures with her. Um, and so you can see here, these are little conical petal cells. Are they not the cutest? Um, and you can see here at the base is that big vacuole full of anthocyanins. And then here are some little uh, carotenoids in chromoplasts. And this is what, if you, just a diagram so that we're all on the same page here, um, a petal cell um, is gonna have the anthocyanins uh, in the vacuole that's gonna take up most of the area. So it's gonna look like this. And if there's plastids, they're gonna be as little distinct compartments. So basically we can just look at petal cells. We don't have to do HPLC, we can just look at petal cells and say, do these have carotenoids or do they have anthocyanins? So that's what Julianne did as she was going around making the phylogeny for these red flower taxa. She was doing petal peels um, and looking, taking pictures like this and looking to see what's there. And here's what we found. Okay, so I was wrong. I thought we were gonna have lots of red flower things that were, that were doing it with anthocyanins. Uh, nope, uh, many things do it with 
uh, dual production, in fact. Even though anthocyanins are common, lots of things do it by producing both in the same cell, both anthocyanins and carotenoids. Making red flowers with just carotenoids, not so common. Only a few species do it. One of them is that Marquia coccinea that I showed you early on. Um, I'm forgetting off the top of my head, which is the other one. Um, Julianne might remember if she's on the call, but um, sorry. So uh, it turned out these are sort of roughly equally <laughs> common ways to do it. I thought this one would be less common because it's uh, making two things, seems like not parsimonious. But I think maybe one thing I was forgetting was that probably a lot of these species came from a yellow ancestor or an orange ancestor that were already making carotenoids and now they just had to add anthocyanin pigments on top. So maybe not as hard as I thought. So um, what was cool about this uh, was that it seemed like, oh gosh, well, there's just lots of ways to make red flowers. Maybe there's no rules about this. Well, actually there are some rules, which is that when you make red flowers with, red, with anthocyanins, you tend to make the red pelargonin pigments either alone or in combination with some of the other anthocyanins. When you make um, red flowers from a combination of the two, you get to use purple anthocyanins. So it's like fun, fun color mixing for plants. Um, you take yellow or orange carotenoids and you put purple anthocyanins on top and you get a red flower. And these things, these differences can happen in such closely related taxa. So here's petunia and it's doing what I thought would happen, red flowers with red anthocyanins. And here's calibracoa and it's making just as red flowers, but it's doing it with a combination of purple anthocyanins and orange carotenoids and smacking them together. Okay, so kind of zooming back out, there are these two pathways that um, we, we've known about for a fair bit of time, um, particularly the structure of the pathway, the regulation of the anthocyanin pathway we're still learning about, uh, and the carotenoid pathway, but even more to learn. And, and it turns out that both of these pathways have a lot to do with flower color. Anthocyanins is the pathway where, you know, if you think about flower color, anthocyanins is the pathway where most of the literature is, but the carotenoids have a lot to do with it. And I think we, we have a lot more to learn because um, there's probably a lot of crosstalk between these pathways. How do you get them both on in the same tissue um, and make these patterns with them? So like, look at this sweet little calibracoa here, that orange there is almost certainly carotenoids and then somehow it's learned to turn on anthocyanins just in the center. So plants have lots of fancy tricks and we can learn a lot from them and from their tricks. So I'll just close by saying, so what are we doing at this point? So I sort of alluded to the fact that I want to try and figure out how we can learn about how traits evolve at sort of a more whole phylogeny scale. Um, and in this sense, it makes, um, makes a lot of sense to try and start with a group where, boy, we know flower color and petunia as well as we can know flower color in any organism. <laughs> like we really know a ton about it. So. Um, with Julianne, started this project, Luke has been working on it, other people in my lab. We're basically trying to build out Petunia and its allies, this clade, as a model clade for understanding how flower color evolves. So we started by building the phylogeny. This is not um, a full phylogeny. We have an up-to-date one. If you want to see it, Luke is presenting at Botany next week, and so he'll show um, a pretty complete phylogeny, actually, that we have now for Petunia. And we're hoping to then put um, gene expression changes onto this phylogeny and really try to walk away with the rules of how flower color evolves um, in a much more holistic sense. Because what Iachroma taught me was, oh, Iachroma is breaking all the rules. So how far do the rules extend? Do what we know in Petunia, is it gonna work across all of Petunia or even within this Petunia clade, are we gonna find that the rules vary? And so hopefully, I don't know, five, 10 years, uh, we can tell you the answer. So, um, there have been lots of people involved in this. Uh, I'll just list um, some of the people who are not in the lab anymore, but whose work I showed, Julianne, Dan, and Max. Um, these are the current members of the lab. Of course, we're all uh, you know, um, physically separated thanks to COVID, but we have lab meetings and um, we get to share little plants and things with each other. So um, I'm happy to take questions and here's some links to find out more. Should I stop sharing my screen, Chelsea? Uh, it's up to you. Usually people do. Plus, if you have like okay. things you want to refer back to, but you can always start sharing your screen again. Okay, I'll leave it shared in case anyone has questions on the slide. Okay. So if anybody has questions, you can unmute your mic in your video and you can ask or you can ask in a chat Just a couple of minutes. Uh, 
Uh, it's a great talk, Stacey. It's always interesting oh, sure. to hear. Chelsea, I have a, okay, go for it. I have a question. Um, that was a really great talk, Stacey. It's nice to get caught up on what you've been up to since I haven't been able to follow it all. <laughs> and come out. Thanks, Dick. Um, you showed that in that anthocyanin pathway that went from uh, to get to the purple flowers, there was an F3H gene and then the F3-5H gene. Mm -hmm. And the F3H gene was the one that was uh, altered by <clears throat> some uh, transcription factor. And then the other one had been deleted. Mm -hmm. um, if the first one, the alteration of the F3H gene, uh, was sufficient to result in red uh, pigments, wouldn't then the uh, selection simply be reduced on the F3-5 gene so that if it got deleted by chance, no problem. Yeah. yeah, that is a that's a really great great question, Dick. Yes, you are very you are very correct that if you just turn off, I'll just go back to that. Well, actually, right here is fine. Whoops. Oh dear. Apparently, I'm bad with the mouse. Okay, so you're right. If you turn off this gene, you're going to make red, and that's it. That's all you needed to do. And in other taxa, that's kind of so morning glories. That's all they did. Um, so I personally think that this is probably the first change that happened and that this was sort of a decay. So um, I will note that this gene is labeled F3 prime 5 prime H, and in some species, it can do some of the job. Like it can do both steps. That's why it has both numbers here. Um, it looks like in Solanaceae, it's not super good at doing both steps, but it can do it a little bit. And so in crosses, when we have this gene, it can still pull a little bit of this precursor away from red flowers. So I think um, it was sort of part of consolidating that new uh, phenotype, that new pathway flux. But um, the other thing that's interesting about this gene is that it seems to be very disposable. So the thing that would keep plants from deleting this gene is what if they need purple pigments elsewhere? What if they're gonna make blueberries? Well, then they need this gene to make their blueberries. Mm -hmm. um, seems like that's not the case. This particular branch of the pathway has been deleted over and over again. The entire morning glory family doesn't have this branch of the pathway. Arabidopsis and other brassicaceae don't have this branch of the pathway. But things like that um, water lily that I showed at the beginning, they do have delphinin in. So this branch is old, it's deeply conserved, but it has a lot of losses within families that seem to be tolerated just fine. So um, this gene is disposable. Other genes in the pathway do not seem to be disposable. We have never seen a deletion of this gene. Um, and I think it's because plants need the other product of this gene, which going up this way is quercetin. It's an important plant sunscreen, and I think if you delete it, you just burn up. <laughs> but thanks for the question, Dick. That was a great one. I think Lynn has a question. Uh, so what about red flower clays of cestrum? Do they come out as dead ends in our understanding of cestrum evolution? Yes, yes, they do. So they are, um, actually, I don't know where they are on this tree. I should be able to spot it. <laughs> if you look at this tree, you see this whole clay that has no red flowers. Well, you can guess that that's um, selenum. Uh, and I think, um, I think actually Sestrum is right around here. They're one of the dual production groups. Um, and yeah, I guess I don't have, I don't have a picture from the, um, uh, from the paper that shows the, the particular Sestrums, but it's, it's astonishingly the same. If you zoom in anywhere on this phylogeny where there look to be little clusters, because we filled in with the close relatives, we know that in fact, these are not whole clades. They look just like this all across the phylogeny. I think this little clade here might be um, Brigmansia vulcanicola and sanguinea. Um, and I think this is either the only sister pair or, or one of two. But the rest of the phylogeny looks just like this, just little singleton. So it's a very strikey tippy pattern that tells me something's going on with red flowers but like i said it's going to be hard to study because they keep pruning themselves from the tree and then we have two more questions um so oh do you want to i have a question hi okay. hi Steph. thank you hi. great talk uh, what do you think about these flowers that had uh, sometimes two colors like uh, for example some patches with purple but the the tube is white or a different color. 
it's some transitions in the cells between these patches and the and the other parts of the flower that have different colors. It's so common, for example, in Solandre, that some Corolla has the tooth from one color, but the lobes from a different color. What do you have? Some yeah, names? actually, I should go to it. I should go back to. Um, I should go back to this slide here. So what's going on is that um, these MIBs, these genes right here that, that are the activators and these repressors, there are lots of them. And they can be specialized for, for coming on in particular times. So you can have, say, a MIB that just turns on pigment in the veins. Like that's known from Snapdragon and it's also true in Petunia. There's also MIBs that will just turn, um, sorry, I keep doing that, I'm terrible. Um, there are MIBs that will just turn color on at the base of the flower or just in the limbs. And so honestly, all of that tinkering, that really fine scale patterning comes down to the crosstalk between this, this set of activators and this set of repressors. It makes it very hard to study <laughs> because um, in a single flower, there's lots of these MIBs. If it's pattern, there's lots of these MIBs and it's gonna be really hard to figure out which do which job, especially in something like Calibracoa where like the color's different on the outside of the petal to the inside of the petal, to the center of the flower, to the outside of the flower, to the veins, to the not veins. Um, so it's all made possible by this combinatoric structure. But yeah, I mean, we're hoping that in this Petuni project that I mentioned, um, where we've got all of these, I mean, I'm not showing it uh, in this phylogeny at all, um, but you know, there's whole clades that are patterned. All of Nuremberghia is patterned, pretty much. Calibracoa is exceptionally patterned. And this is like one of its most chill patterns here, but obviously it has much more extreme patterns. But Brunfelsia, not right? Those whole flowers are purple or white. So we do have maybe some potential to understand how different are the MIBs in Brunfelsia versus all of these things that have patterns. You know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a key there, but it's going to be a hard thing to learn the logic of. Stacy, um, so how does it work in the Brunfelsia that, fa that the flower color changes across the life of the flower? How does that work? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. And I mean, boy, this would be a great PhD thesis for somebody. So um, for a long time, it was thought that uh, those flower color changes within the life of a plant, the life of a flower could happen sort of passively, like the anthocyanins could just degrade. But actually, anthocyanins are really stable. I mean, think about the dried blueberries in your cabinet, like they're still blue, there's still anthocyanins in there. Um, so these pigments don't just degrade like that. They actually have to be actively um, dispersed, broken down, um, or transported out of the vacuole. And so from Brunfelsia, people have found, no surprise, MIBs that actually pull anthocyanins back out of the vacuole. So it seemed wild, but those Brunfelsia, the yesterday, today, tomorrows, they make the anthocyanins, they get shunted into the vacuole, and then to turn pale, they get pulled back out again. And so it could well be that those same genes are doing flower color change more broadly, um, but nobody nobody has looked. It's a great it's great to have a candidate gene at all. So we know something about the genetic basis, and maybe that's what's going on in Brunfelsia. And I don't know because it also it also happens in several different selenums in different lineages as well. Mm. That the business yeah. of being dark purple and then through the age of the flower going white. So it would be quite yeah. a cool thing to do across the whole family. Oh, it would be it would be super neat. It would be super neat. Yeah, and I mean, maybe we'll find that, maybe we'll find some of those genes here. <clears throat> We're gonna have tons of transcriptomes. And I would say if anyone wants to collaborate on any aspect of this, like go chase down those MIBs and see what they're doing across different taxa, um, just uh, shoot me an email. We're, I mean, we'll, we'll eventually put all of these in an open repository, um, but we have to kind of get our act together first. We have a couple questions in the chat. Uh, one of it is the colorization and vegetation issue also important in speciation. Are pigment genes particularly prone to the effect of transposons and transposable effects are more visible in colorization genes? Okay, I guess I'll start with the first one was about speciation. Um, in Petunia, people have certainly linked these genes to speciation. Um, 
So in some groups where it seems like pollinators care a lot about flower color, I think these genes will be important in reproductive isolation. Um, in Iochroma, it's a little bit more complicated because it seems like it's more of a, um, a competition-based thing. Um, species seem to make different flower colors more to not compete with other co-flowering Iochromas. Um, and so the speciation event happened and then an Iochroma and then the flower color sort of reinforces that difference. It allows pollinators to say, oh, this is one Iochroma and I'll visit this one and that's a different Iochroma and you can have that one. Um, so flower color can do a lot of things in different environments and a lot of times it has nothing to do with pollinators. A lot of times flower color is, um, uh, dang, I'm really stressed out right now. So I'm going to make some pigments because I'm, I'm uh, you know, the sun's really bright here and I'm stressed and I need some sunscreen. Um, so there's lots of roles that pigmentation plays. And a, a hint is, if you're ever wondering if that's the case, if the pigmentation difference is across the entire plant, and you see this in lots of annuals actually, um, where you see a, a, a darker morph and the dark morph will have darker flowers and darker leaves, that's a whole physiology response. And it probably has nothing to do with pollinators. It has to do with saying, I'm in a hot spot. I need more sunscreen. Cover me up, please. Um, I, so let's see, what was the second question, Chelsea? I forgot already. Um, are pigment genes particularly prone to the effect of transposons and transposal effects more visible in colorization? That's a really good question. And we should have the ability as we get more genomes to test that. My guess is no, it's just that pigment genes act as their own markers, their own reporter genes. So when, you know, when a transposon happens in there, you get a pigmentation difference that's visible and it begs your attention. You go say, okay, well, what, <laughs> what happened here? Um, so I think it's more likely the case that lots of genes uh, are susceptible to transposons hopping in them, um, as long as the, the transposon doesn't cause a lethal effect. Uh, it's just that with pigmentation, we can see it. Another question, are red flower species, are, are they always hummingbird pollinated? Um, so the truth is that we haven't studied um, all of these little origins. Um, in Iochroma, the two that we know are hummingbird pollinated, but lots of Iochroma, all those purple tubular Iochromas, those are also hummingbird pollinated. So in Iochroma, species really don't care what color it is. They're like, I'm here to eat. And so hummingbirds will visit any color. Um, so, so really that's, that's an open question for somebody to study. There have been some recent transitions in Kelly Brachoa that, um, that would be really ideal to study. Um, but honestly, studying pollination biology is really hard. And when you have a challenge this big, um, <laughs> it's definitely, it would definitely be strategic to take on a group where the phylogeny is pretty complete and you can look at a lot of species that are closely related and catch all the transitions. And I would say, Petunia and Calibracoa are probably ideal for that. All right, is there any other last questions before you wrap up? There was one about, I think you kind of already touched on this, the color intensity related to light and temperature. You kind of mentioned that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, if people have more questions, they can always shoot me an email or I can hang out on chat after we stop recording. Uh, we will have a meeting next week, but then the week after, there'll be a little bit of a break for the botany conference. Um, yeah, you can definitely email Stacy and follow her on Twitter and continue this conversation uh, in either place. Uh, thank you so much, Stacy. It's been really Thanks. fun. Yeah. It's great to see everybody. Have a good day. Oh, mm -hmm. I'll stop sharing my screen so that I guess other people can see other people. Um, nice to see you too, Stacy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.